my sermons over the next little while and Pastor Grant's are going to be titled Towards the Cross. Because we want to turn our attention and focus our minds on the cross in this season. And today we're going to be starting in Mark chapter 1 and we're going to be exploring the Gospel of Mark over the next few weeks and looking at the curiosities that we see in Mark chapter 1 but throughout the book of Mark itself. And Mark is a really interesting gospel to study because it features things that no other gospel features and it has little tiny sentences that Jesus says that really bring about a lot of theological theological curiosity. Uh, For me, as someone that enjoys studying, uh, it's really a wonderful thing. But today, we're going to have a look at what this season brings us. As we dig through the book of Mark, we see themes of salvation, we see themes of healing, we see themes of restoration, we see allusions to the second coming, acknowledgements of prophecy being fulfilled, and prophecy being made for what will come. The Gospel of Mark is the, one of the shortest Gospels, but it is jam-packed, full of theological depth, but depth and inspiration for your life. The Gospel of Mark seeks to answer one question. Who is this man? Now, you, being 2,000 plus whatever years after Jesus, you have the benefit of hindsight. You know who this man was, particularly if you're sitting in this room. You most likely know who Jesus was. But the Gospel of Mark was written for an audience that wasn't so sure. And so he's answering the question, who is this man? Who is Jesus? And the Gospel of Mark really digs into this through story, through explanation, through showing the authority, through showing the power, and through showing the wisdom of Jesus to people so that they will have no doubt that Jesus truly is the Messiah. So some context. Mark is, we believe, from all of our understandings and a whole heap of study, I won't spend give hours going into it, but as we look at the Gospel of Mark, we realise that most of the other Gospels are kind of based on Mark. There's some other material, we think there's another document out there that we don't have, that some of the material was based on as well, but the Mark is the first Gospel to be written. Matthew appears first, but Mark is the first Gospel to be written. It follows a story of Jesus mostly chronologically, John doesn't do that. John just kind of, he writes whatever, th- whatever he felt he wanted to write to prove his uh, purpose of writing, which we know from John chapter 1, is to show that Jesus is the Word and the Word is Jesus and Jesus is Scripture made flesh. That's the purpose of, of the Gospel of John. And he lines up his stories to show that. Whereas in Mark, he kind of just goes through the story chronologically as much as he can. Then... As I said before, the whole gospel sets out to answer who Jesus is. It's also written for a Gentile audience who we believe is based in Rome. So it's not written for Jews. It's written for Gentiles. It's written for people who didn't have quite as much context to the story, which is why we see some of the things that we see in in Mark stresses the power of Jesus over demonic forces, right? And we see that in almost every single chapter in the first eight chapters, there's some form of unclean spirit that Jesus is getting rid of. Because they're showing that Jesus has authority over the things that the Gentiles have been dealing with. Jesus is for them as well. A common theme throughout this whole gospel is that Jesus asks for secrecy with many of his miracles. Jesus He finishes a miracle and he goes, all right, you're healed, don't tell anyone about it. He does it time and time again throughout the Gospel of Mark. He does it a few times in the Gospel of Luke. But there's this whole theme of secrecy in the Gospel of Mark. You might wonder why. I hope that over the next couple of weeks we can answer that question. Why on earth was Jesus afraid of people knowing who he was? I also want to tell you it wasn't very successful, Jesus asking for secrecy people tended to share with others that they were healed. Um, I think you would too if you had a whole heap of demonic forces leave you. So, Mark 1 verse 1. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mark 1, we're going to read from verses 1 through to verse 8, 
And we're going to unpack that bit, and then we'll do another two sections of chapter 1 as well today. So we're just in, in Mark chapter 1. We're going to jump to some other spots, but they'll all be on the screen. But if you want to follow, follow along in your Bible, it's Mark chapter 1. This is what it says. It says, The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down to untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's a lot happening in eight verses. Mark packs detail and material into his gospel and so we're not going to get bogged down in all the detail we're going to be taking a very high level look at things so i apologize for that Uh, we don't have the time to go as deep as you might want that's why at uh at university we had a whole subject devoted just to the gospel of mark to attempt to scratch the surface of what's going on in the gospel of mark but we see straight away that the writer of Mark is declaring that there is a fulfillment of prophecy. There is a fulfillment of prophecy found in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, where it says, A voice cries out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. In other words, he's saying that this prophecy is being fulfilled through this Jesus character I'm about to tell you about. That his way has been made straight, that was prepared for him by John the Baptist, and this guy is this Messiah, which Isaiah 40 spends a lot of time talking about. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. In other words, let's make this way clear. Let's make it wide. Let's make it certain that this guy is the Messiah for everyone. He's not just for a couple of people. He's not just someone who claimed to be the Messiah. No, this guy has all the features. This Jesus character has all the features of the Messiah who's been promised who is going to save the world from their sins. There's also this idea of a messenger sent to prepare the way. Now, in the book of Mark and Luke and John, we see that this messenger is none other than John the Baptist. For context, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. Many people thought that John the Baptist was the Messiah. In fact, if you go to some of the other Gospels, you see that they were trying to crown him and say, all right, you're going to be our Messiah, you're going to lead us. And he had to tell them to back off. I am not he, but he is coming. As, as Adventists, have you ever heard of the Elijah message? Anyone ever heard of the Elijah message? There's lots of talk about the Elijah message. We're going to touch on it again later. But the Elijah message is this idea that the prophet Elijah was sent to prepare the way and that that John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way and that we identify ourselves as also being sent to prepare the way of the Lord who is coming. To preach, to let people know that there is an opportunity for salvation now and they need to accept it. But there's this messenger who's sent to prepare the way. And John the Baptist was this messenger. Sent to prepare the way, to prepare the people, to start to set a standard of what Jesus was going to be about. Now, if you remember back to what we read just before, did John the Baptist sound like a very attractive guy? Would a guy who eats locusts be very attractive to you to follow? Has some honey? Oh, honey's nice but he was wearing camel's hair. He, had, he wasn't exactly someone you'd want to open your door to, was he? But he was out there preaching and he was gaining a following. And in fact, some of the disciples who were going to follow Jesus, particularly Andrew, were already following John the Baptist as his followers, as his disciples. 
He was getting a following. He was getting attention. And he wasn't just getting attention of the people. John the Baptist was getting attention of the Jewish leadership. And they were starting to wonder what this guy was doing. Who gave this guy authority to baptize for redemption? He was out there baptizing by immersion before Jesus had already brought this this tradition about. He understood what was coming and he was active in making it happen. Leads me to a, a thought. How active are we today in making what we know is going to come something of our present reality. We know that Jesus is returning. Are we willing to be a John the Baptist and get out there and look a little weird? People call Adventists a peculiar... Well, we call ourselves, sorry, a peculiar people. No one else calls us a peculiar people. We call ourselves a peculiar people. Why don't we live up to that? And share that there's this guy who's returning who is going to save you if you let him who already has saved you, if you're letting. So he preached, he teached, John, this is John the Baptist, for repentance of sins, and he was already a countercultural force. But Jesus was going to be so much more. If John was radical, Jesus was extreme. There was something different about these guys. Israel expected a revolutionary leader. As we look around our world today, we can see that there's many places that also are kind of expecting a revolutionary leader who are looking for someone to make a difference in their present reality. Who want to flip the tables and start again in their societies. And Israel was looking for the same. They wanted this, this Messiah to be someone who was going to destroy the Romans. But Jesus was not that, yet he was also so much more. John the Baptist was preparing the people for a Messiah that would be more like a lamb than a lion, that would be more like a loving, kind, generous person than an angry, buckling, sword-carrying, evil, crazy, demonic leader. Jesus was always going to be the lamb. Those in Israel just didn't want to believe it. They already had the imagery in their sanctuary scene. That they had no idea what Jesus was going to be like. Jesus is a more perfect choice to bring salvation into the world than any other option. Why do I say this? Well, we had the sacrificial system that I just mentioned. And in the sacrificial system, the Jews had kind of misconstrued that and turned it into a capitalistic system that gave people access to salvation if they were willing to have a pure enough lamb that they could pay enough for. But Jesus is a more perfect choice. You see, he succeeded where Israel failed. In Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15, it says, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn of heart, the Spirit descending like a dove on him, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. There's a lot of stuff that happened again in these few verses. A lot of stuff happened in these verses. John was arrested. I'm not even going to really touch on that too much today. But John was arrested, and we know that eventually, in a few verses, in the Gospel of Mark at least, he dies. But most of all, Jesus was baptised. And at this baptism, we see the Trinity. All three, present in one moment. For those that aren't so sure, I can tell you the Trinity is an equal, co-equal partnership. One God, 
in three different ways. They're all present. The voice, God, Dove, Spirit, and Jesus, the Son, right here, showing their co-equal partnership with one another and that Jesus was about to begin this ministry that he was set out to do. The Spirit descends, making it clear for the reader, for those that are Gentiles in Rome, that this man is truly the Messiah. He is fulfilling everything that John had set up, that the gospel of the, well, the gospels had set up, that Isaiah had set up, that all the prophets had set up. This man, this guy, he is the Messiah. And even today, when we baptize, we take part in this experience of the Trinity. The shared experience of declaring that Jesus is Lord and that we are following a new way. That baptism was to mark the beginning of Jesus' ministry. For us, it's a public confession that we are followers of that guy, that radical, that extremist, who truly was and truly is the Son of God. As we move towards the cross this Easter, and as we look at what Jesus has done and who he is, we realize that he was a countercultural force that was different to anything that Israel had seen before. You see, plenty of people, as you read the history books, they claimed that they were the Messiah. They all looked different, they all acted in different ways, but this guy, this Jesus guy, He was something different. He preached with power and authority, and more than that, he healed with authority as well. We also then see in those few verses a wilderness experience. In the other Gospels, we get a protracted look at what happened in the wilderness. But in this Gospel, it just says that Jesus went out for 40 days, the devil tempted him, the angels waited on him, and he came back. Now, why is the number 40 important? Is anyone, anyone willing to take a dig at why the number 40 is important? It's pretty obvious. How many years did Israel spend in the wilderness? 40, right? Jesus did what the Israelites couldn't. He spent time in the wilderness... For 40 days and 40 nights. Can you do anything for 40 days and 40 nights without getting bored? Was it why? Just cause? Symbolism? It's because he is the fulfillment of all that we couldn't and cannot be. He fulfilled all of that. He resisted temptation. He didn't give in. For 40 days and for 40 nights. And then he goes on and continues his ministry. And as soon as he leaves the wilderness, he begins healing and teaching and preaching. And I'm going to say that Jesus was the very first truly celebrity preacher. Now, I don't like celebrity preachers. If you're a preacher and people love you just because you're who you are, I'm going, eh. I don't like you. I'm a little bit mean like that because I I really struggle when we identify ourselves with a person over the gospel. When Palmer said, I really like the teachings of this preacher, I'm like, but are there teachings in line with the gospel? That's what's more important. That's a little aside. But celebrity preacher, Jesus was the very first one. In Mark Chapter 1, and it goes from verse 16 to 28, says, As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat, with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. The Gospel of Luke says that this was Jesus' tradition, to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath and to preach and teach. 
The other week I shared this with um, the, the youth, this whole story about how Jesus did this and how it was to prepare the way, but also so that we can have a purpose. And our purpose is in line with Jesus' purpose. And that he wants to equip us to give us the tools that we need in order to go out there and to share his gospel. But in the book of Mark, it doesn't go that deep. It just touches the surface. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. The other Gospels doesn't go through this. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him, and they were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him? At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. I can just imagine the whispers now around the edge of the Sea of Galilee. Hey, did you hear about this guy? He came in a synagogue and he, you know that crazy, crazy old mate? He's healed. I can just imagine the wonder at who this man could be. You see, they know from the prophet Isaiah that the Messiah was going to be one who could teach and preach with authority, but also one who could heal, who could get rid of the evil spirits, who could heal the blind, who could save the sick, who could change their present reality for something that is better. Jesus calls his disciples to be fishers of men. I always found that to be a little bit funny, to be fishers of men. I think we don't have a hook. and Anyway, it's okay. But I think the real reason is that Jesus wants us to be caught up in his gospel, to be all about him, to be caught up as though a fish is caught in a net, but also to have one purpose, a purpose that is all about Jesus. And Jesus' disciples, when they, when they heard him say, follow me, they got up. And they followed him. That seems a little bit strange to us. For a bit more context, the disciples knew Jesus. They knew who he was. In in some of the other Gospels, John the Baptist says to Andrew, that man, you need to follow him. And so he does. And he convinces all the others to follow him. There's different accounts. But in this one, the writer uses fishing as the imagery for the Gospel that we can be caught up for a purpose, to be caught up in the good news that's more attractive than anything else that's on offer. If the good news was some bait, I'm hooked. I'm hooked on the good news for our world today. And I want you to be as well. Because each of us need a purpose. Each of us needs direction. Each of us needs a more perfect direction in life than we currently have. We need something like that, and that is what our world is searching for. One of the subjects I'm studying for my master's at the moment is all about ministry in cultural pluralism. Big words, right? Basically, we live in a society that wants everything to have an equal footing. And if everything has an equal footing, which is good, it leaves many people wondering which thing to follow, which way of life to follow. And it means that we, as a church, have a duty to show people that Jesus is the most attractive option that's out there. Not to say the other options are horrible to them, but to show them that Jesus is more attractive. To show them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That he gives them hope and a purpose in this season. That during Easter, the cross, what Jesus has done for them, is far more radical than any of these other ways of finding purpose. They can truly live a wholehearted life following the cross, leaning towards the cross, walking. Towards the cross. 
So what are we called to do today? I mentioned the Elijah message before. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, it says, Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children, the hearts of children to their parents, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. Sounds sounds terrible, right? Jesus is coming back. Jesus came, right? Right? John the Baptist turns people's minds towards Jesus. But this still has meaning for us today. We usually stop at verse, the end of verse 5. We forget about verse 6 as a church. Very rarely do I hear it preached. But verse 6 is even more important. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children, and the hearts of children to their parents, that it will not come and strike the land with a curse. In other words, we have a duty to teach each other, to teach our children about what Jesus is doing for them right now, and that Jesus is returning. So that they too can know what we are all about, and so that they too can go on with purpose, and so that our church can shut the back door and keep all of our families in, so that we can grow in warmth and community with one another. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel. What's the eternal gospel, church? It's not something other than Jesus. It is only that Jesus Christ is Lord and Saviour and that He is returning. That's it. There's no other additions. You might be upset with me, but that's the reality. The gospel is only one thing and the gospel is Jesus and His salvation for you. To proclaim to those, to preach to those who live on the earth to every nation and tribe and language and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. That's just the first angel. We have a purpose today. If we are going to bring people in to his kingdom, We have to be willing to get out there and preach, to show them the cross, to encourage people to walk towards the cross. But more than that, if you aren't on an active journey towards the cross, accepting what Jesus has done for you, there's no point. To be in an active relationship with Jesus today. We're called to know Jesus, to share him, to prepare the way for his soon return. Jesus was healing, he was teaching, he was preaching. He heals a demon-possessed man and he's instantly the talk of the town. What could we do that's good to be the talk of the town? And I can tell you, every single year we do something that makes us the talk of the town. Road to Bethlehem. Man, what an opportunity, right? Every year, we have an opportunity to show people Jesus and to show people the cross. Very few churches have that opportunity. We should be leaning in, taking that up. All getting involved in sharing Jesus in that moment. He was, was he a celebrity pastor? Was he the saviour of the world or was he both? I think he was both in, in his day. But most of all, he's the saviour of the world. And the lasting question that everyone in the synagogue had was who gave this man authority? And the author of Mark had already answered the question for us, right? If we go back to the beginning of, of the sermon, who gave this man authority? The Holy Spirit and God. He was given authority by the Holy Spirit and God at his baptism to go out into the world, to preach, to teach, to heal and to save. But most of all, I want to ask you today, who gives you authority to preach and to teach and to share and to love? We know that we have the Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit that descended on Jesus at his baptism. The same one. Not different, the same one. And that same Holy Spirit, Paul goes on about this a lot, gives us authority to teach and preach as the priesthood of all believers today. 
It's not just Pastor Andrew and Pastor Grant that are preaching and teaching. It shouldn't be. We've got a lot going on in our lives. We can't do all of it. Both of us have a lot going on. We want to do a lot. We can't do all of it. So that's why we're a priesthood of all believers as a church. And we don't always live that out well due to our structures, our hierarchy, whatever. But at Forrester's Beach, I want to live out being the priesthood well. That we all, male and female, young and old, have a role in sharing God's gospel with the Central Coast. Because we need to prepare the way this Easter. We're not going to be getting out there straight away, but we need to prepare the way at the very least in this place so that people can have access to the cross at Forrester's Beach Church. We're going to sing a song called I Need Thee Every Hour. As we go through March, as we march towards Easter, I pray that you will focus on Jesus each and every day and allow him to prepare your heart to accept what he has done for you in giving you salvation. Let's sing. Loving Father in heaven, we need you. Every hour, Lord, we we need you as we look towards the cross. As we are marching week by week towards Easter, I pray that you will open our hearts to you. But also, most of all, you will open our hearts to being used by you for your purpose. That we will accept your authority over our lives. Wonderful name, we pray each of these things. Amen.